morning, Grace Christian Church. I hope everyone is doing well this morning. Let's put those hands together. Let's get ready to worship. Come on. Come on, let's sing it out. I praise. I praise you in the valley. Praise you on the mountain.
start to forget all of the great things you did. When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? Come on, in one voice, you are more than able. Good morning, Grace. So good to be with you on a beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Dan. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Grace, joined with my good friend good Jeff this morning. And we just, again, want to welcome you, especially if you're visiting with us for the first time. Grace family, let's just welcome our, our guests, our visitors here today. 
Really glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us this morning. I tell you what, this, this weather has me thinking summer vacation. Spring and then I looked at the calendar, and that has me thinking summer vacation already. I can't believe <laughs> this school year is coming to an end pretty soon, which uh, immediately threw me into a panic because then I had to realize, what is my son doing all summer long when school is no longer in session? And then I breathed a sigh of relief because I remember my wife already signed him up for summer camp here at Grace uh, which is really exciting. It's a great opportunity that we have as a church family to care for kids, to love some kids in our community this summer. And so parents, if you have an elementary age child kind of needing that child care over the summer, we've got an all-day kids camp available. Uh, registration has been open for a while. There are still spots left. Uh, and that summer camp is going to run through the first week of June uh, through about mid-July. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity uh, for your kid to get some, have some fun, do some arts and crafts, like do activities out here with other kids, and one of the things that I love about that is that uh, all the, the counselors, you know, the leaders, people leading that are, are going to love your kids well, and they're going to love God well, uh, and, and share that love of Christ with the kids uh, throughout that week, so that's that's a great thing. Another cool thing about a, a program like this that we're able to do at the church, obviously that all, all the funds that we receive from a, from a kids camp continue to fund ministry around here at Grace and, and allow us to do the things that God is calling us to do. So if you're still looking for child care for your kid over the summer, uh, maybe you know of other parents who are starting to panic over that, and then point them to this link, point them to Grace Christian. We'd love to have them. And I also want you to know, man, if you're a high school student, college student, somebody else, anybody else looking for a career change and you want to work in a summer camp over the summer, we'd love to talk to you. We're looking for uh, starting the process of hiring camp counselors uh, for that span of June through mid-July. So if you're looking for that summer job opportunity, there's an email address on the screen behind me, camp at gracechristian.tv. You can email that or uh, even put it on your connection card that you'd be interested uh, in working at the camp. And Steve Miner, our shift campaign and finance director here at Grace, would love to talk to you about that. So don't forget about Kids Summer Camp here at Grace. And, and many of you have known Jeff. He's been a part of our church for a while, and we've had him with us on stage a lot of times. In fact, we commissioned Jeff and his wife a, a number of months ago because God has placed something on their heart uh, that, that he really feels strongly about, and they've been just listening and learning and pursuing and having conversations. So, Jeff, just uh, for those who maybe don't know you yeah. or what you've called to, like, tell us again what this microchurch movement is. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. You know, uh, my wife and I love being a part of Grace. Uh, this has just been a wonderful, life-giving experience uh, uh, each week as we gather with you. Uh, and we feel like we're on the right road. Watch this. But we're going to take it in a little different direction. There you go. I feel like God is well calling played. Don and I to something unique and different. And it's called a part, it's, it's just actually being a part of a worldwide movement, a discipleship movement. So we're excited about that. And we're looking to launch uh, a network of small, simple gatherings called microchurches. And so uh, we've been praying about who would be involved with us to be a part of that. We want to go where God's at work already. And I feel like there's probably 10 to 12 families at Grace that have this adventurous, missional, uh, missionary spirit. And so if that's you, we want to connect with you. And my wife and I have been uh, in the connection point for the last uh, month or so, and we'll continue to be. We want to talk to you about that. We've got a great opportunity for you to join us for a series of meetings for a month or so, just to discuss it, answer your questions, to just uh, lay out what it means to, and Andrew's going to get me for this, to lay out what it means to live in incarnational rhythms in life, <laughs> how to make yeah. disciples in your network. You're talking my language. Now That's we're talking his. doctor <laughs> right here. Yeah, and so this, this whole season for you guys and the people yeah. who are interested, this is not like the the dive in head first, we're right. committing for life. This is the still discovery phase. So anybody who's interested and yeah. in having these conversations, this is just learning more, right? That's exactly right. No commitment required at this point. We just want to discuss, answer your questions and pray with you and be looking for that date for those meetings. And then eventually we're going to ask you to make a commitment and just go with us to see what God can do through a small group of people who believe in his grace and his power. 
Yeah, I love it. They're, they're praying for people who are, have that curiosity of spirit, maybe that little bit of adventure inside of you that you're kind of called to, to experience something new. And here's the thing about this idea of microchurch. For all of us sitting in a room like this, it's a pretty unfamiliar thing. For a lot of us, if we've been around church for a while, this is the context that we know. And so the idea of, of being a part of a church that's somehow smaller or different or operates in a different manner is so foreign to us. But the reality is, this is the way the church looks uh, in large portions of the world, they only meet in home-type churches and microchurches. It's how the church started. And what we're actually seeing right now across our country as well is new expressions of this kind of church popping up, and they are seeing incredible movements of God through discipleship and mission and impact and, yeah. and life transformation. And Jeff just has a passion for that, believe that God wants to do something like that here. So if you've got an inkling in your spirit just of, man, what is that about you're not going to ruin any of your life or his by, by starting to ask some questions and, and getting to know Jeff and Don just a little bit. So again, they'll be at Connection Point this week, every week, uh, as much as they're able. So feel free to reach out to them. And, uh, and he mentioned a moment ago this idea of being on the right road, but somehow going in, in the wrong direction a little bit. And that's the series that we're in right now as a church, talking about those things that God puts inside of our hearts that are good, that are desirable for us, and yet so often, apart from God, we chase after those things in the wrong direction. And so this morning, I believe Andrew's got a really, really good word for us this, this morning. So, so Jeff, would you go ahead and pray for us as we prepare to hear that? Thank you, Father, for bringing our lives together here today. And we want to put ourselves in a position today, Lord, to hear from you, to... Uh, to hear about that next best step for our life, to be even more like Jesus. And so we open up our hearts and our minds to receive from your spirit that which you have, uh, are calling us to. So prepare us and move us in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, growing up, uh, my dad would tell me about uh, his childhood, and uh, it seemed like, like a fairy tale. Like, even when he would tell me about his childhood, I already, always pictured it like in black and white, because it seemed so far ago. Like, my dad was the youngest of six kids, was raised on a dairy farm in southern Indiana. They didn't have indoor plumbing uh, in their house. And even when I was young, I'd go visit my grandfather's house. The old outhouse was still there. And I don't know if this was unique. Um, it was odd to me. The thing I remember is that it had three holes. You know, I've had to go to the bathroom really bad uh, several times in life, but never have I considered doing it as a community. You know, I'm like, who, who are all these people that were going to the bathroom at the same time in this outhouse? And I just remember his childhood seemed so odd to me. Uh, he told me that when he was 10 years old, he had never tasted a potato chip before. Everything that he ate um, came from their farm. The only ingredient they ever bought was salt. And so uh, all the vegetables they raised on their farm, all the animals uh, were butchered right there on their farm. And one day they were driving down the road and God provided this incredible miracle. There was this delivery truck and a crate of potato chips fell off the truck. They went over and they picked it up. They tried to find the truck. They couldn't find it. And so they had all the potato chips they could eat. My dad's 10 years old, first time in his life ever tasting potato chips. He said he ate so many till he had an open sore on the roof of his mouth. All of his siblings, they ate till they were sick, which is why they needed three holes in the outhouse. And so, <laughs> but he'd tell me these stories and it was like, what world were you raised in? And now I'm at the age where when I talk about my childhood, to my kids, they look at me like, who are you? You know, like out the other day, I was explaining to Jude what it was like having a, a landline phone in your house. He has no concept of that. My, my grandparents actually had party lines where they would share a phone line with a few neighbors. You know, you'd have a different ring to know if it was for you or if it was for your neighbors. Sometimes you pick up the phone and other people on there talking. I'm explaining all this to Jude and answering machines. And sometimes you just call people, you know. And they'd be maybe gone on vacation for a week, and they don't call you back, but you couldn't have known that. You know, we just waited for them to call us back. And I'm explaining this stuff to Jude, and, and he looks at me like I was hanging out with Abraham Lincoln or something. You know, like, what world are you from? 
Like, how many of you all now have a Life 360 on your phone, have your kids, know where they're at at all times? What a great invention. You know, I mean, I know where my kids are at all times. You know, I know when my daughter leaves home and arrives at school, when she gets to her boyfriend's house. Like, a, an alarm goes off on my phone if he even tries to kiss her. It's amazing uh, <laughs> the technology we have. You know, my parents, they had no clue where I was at. You would just leave, you'd tell me you're going to be home, and you'd come home. I remember one night getting home right at curfew. It was at midnight. I pull up to my parents' property. There's a little bridge that goes over the creek in the front of their property, and it had been raining, and it had flooded over the bridge. So there was nothing I could do. I just pulled the emergency brake, laid back, and went to sleep. About four hours later, I woke up, and I, and I looked up, and the water had went below the bridge. So I went across and went up, and I went inside. My parents were asleep. They didn't know where I was at. They didn't come looking for me. I was just gone for hours. It's just strange how connected we are now and all of the technology that exists that allows us to stay connected, to talk in different ways, to to talk on the phone, to text, all the social media stuff. It's crazy how connected we are. And even just a few years ago, 5, 10, 15 years ago, a generation ago, doesn't even understand any of those things. I never had a cell phone until I was in college. I'd never heard of the internet until I was in high school. My kids think I'm crazy when I tell these kind of stories. And now there are all all these ways to connect. Like my my grandfather, he died in like the late 90s. And so that side of the family, we've kind of struggled staying in touch with each other. I have aunts and uncles and cousins all over the United States. And some of them I haven't seen in, in over a decade. But because of social media, I feel like I know what's going on. Like one of my cousins had a barbecue last night. I know that because he posted about it. And I have another cousin I haven't seen in years. Tuesday, she had a great hair day, posted about it. It was incredible. I have a cousin who I haven't seen probably in 15 years who has kids in high school that I have never met. And this week I saw one of their promposals. It was pretty cool. And you know, so it's so strange how, how connected we are, the things we know about each other. And that's a good thing because that's how God created us. By nature, we were created to be in community. And I think that's what drives the the desire of people of creating technology, different ways to connect, because by nature, we need to be around each other. Even when you go back to the book of Genesis, God creates Adam, and Adam is like in the perfect situation possible. Like God puts him in charge of all of the garden. He has unlimited control and authority. There's no conflict. There's no strife. There's no arguments. It's perfect temperature all day long. God would come down and spend time with him throughout the day, and they would talk together. His world was perfect. And yet God looks down and sees Adam, and this is what he says in Genesis. The Lord said, it's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. Which is an odd thing, because you would think Adam's life is perfect. What else does he need? He's got a perfect relationship with God. We say things like, if I just have God, that's all I need. And God says, no, that's not enough. You need somebody else, Adam, because we were created to live in community. And I think some of this is because we were created in the image and likeness of God. And this is one of the mysteries of Scripture, one of the things I don't fully understand. We know all throughout Scripture that it says that God is one, singular. And yet there's these three different expressions of who he is, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I mean, even at times, you see that they were distinctly different at the baptism of Jesus. Jesus is in the water and The Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and the the voice of the Father comes from heaven. It seems like there's three different things, and yet Scripture continues to say, no, no, there's, there's one. Even in the creation account, we see this idea of singular one God, but yet this plural, this community that exists in the Godhead. It says this in Genesis 1, 26, then God, singular, said, let us make mankind in our image, And in our likeness, let us, is just plural sense of who God is, and yet we know there is only one God. But what we see in eternity is there is this relationship that exists inside of God. Even though he is one, he is community. And so when he created us in his image and in his likeness, we take that on where we desire to be in community. And that's why it's such a great time to be alive, because there are so many ways to connect and to stay in touch and to talk with each other. I mean, as a culture, we are on the right road because we were made to live 
in community. There's a a book that came out a couple decades ago, a documentary and a movie uh, about a guy named Chris McCandless who uh, graduated college, decided he wanted to go live life a little bit different off the grid. He he got away from his family and friends. He backpacked across the United States. He found himself uh, up in the wilderness of Alaska. Some of you all have maybe seen the movie Into the Wild or Call of the Wild, the documentary. And he's living there, and this is what he desired, just to be by himself. Now, uh, I've given you 20 years to watch the movie. Spoiler alert, the guy dies, okay? Uh, He ate some bad berries. He got like dehydrated. He ended up passing away. And when they found him and they found his journal, there was something interesting that was written in his journal. He said, happiness is only real when shared. I mean, this guy did exactly what he wanted to do. He traveled all over the United States. He saw some of those beautiful things in the world. This is what his heart desire was. And he came to the conclusion, like happiness is not really happiness unless there's community around you because we were created to live in community. And that's why it's so great that we live right now when we do because there is so many ways to connect with the world around us. But here's the strange thing. Research is now showing over and over again that this is the loneliest time in human history. In fact, the youngest generation, Gen Zs, this is the most recent research, 73% of Gen Zs report feeling alone, sometimes or always. And I read things like that and I think, how is it possible that this generation who has been raised with so many different ways to connect and to stay in touch and to have social interaction. How is it possible that 73% of them say, I'm either lonely all the time or sometimes? I think what's happened in our culture is we find ourselves on the right road. We're just going in the wrong direction. We've traded in like meaningful, deep relationships that are centered around love for, for followers and likes. Instead of sitting across the table and talking about the things that really matter the most in life, we find ourselves just making comments or following someone. And because of that, we find ourselves on the right road, but it's not leading us where we want to go. Now, the good news is God has always been in the business of forming a community By nature, it's who he is and it's who he created us to be. People who live in community. After God created Adam, he said, that's not good. They need community. He created Eve and then they formed a family. Then through Abraham, he said, hey, I want to create a nation through you, a community of people who will be a blessing to the whole world. And if you read the Old Testament, it's really the story of this community, this group of people that God blessed and preserved. And even when they got off course and did things that God told them not to do, God protected them and blessed them and preserved them because God has always been in the business of creating community. And then when God put on skin in the form of Jesus, we could probably all agree that Jesus didn't need help. They got all the wisdom he needed. The the power of the Holy Spirit was flowing through him. He could have launched this new movement on his own, but by nature, he's a person that desires and needs community from the beginning of eternity. We read about the three that he spent a lot of time with and the the 12 that traveled with him. At one point, it says that he sent out the 72 and they went out and ministered. There were always community of people around Jesus. And then when it came time to launch this movement after his death and his resurrection, He looks at Peter and he says, hey, Peter, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, my ecclesia, the the, the Greek word that actually means a community, assembly, a gathering of people that come together for a purpose and a mission. The, The church was never meant to be an hour on Sunday or a building that we come to. The church by nature is a community. And when Paul talks about this, this movement of people, he talks about it like the human body, saying that everyone is needed in this community. And unless we operate together as a community, we won't be effective. There's no way to take one part of our body and send it off to do its own thing. It requires all of us together. And that's the language of the New Testament, that the body itself, it it builds itself up. It grows as each member does the things it's supposed to do. And when you don't do what you're supposed to do, and when I don't do what I'm supposed to do, and when I avoid community, the church suffers because of it, because God, 
has always been in the business of forming and creating community. Which leads us to the question, how is it possible then, at a time when people are more lonely than ever, when they're in desperate need for community, when they're looking for a place to belong, when three-fourths of Gen Z say, I don't have anybody, I'm alone either sometimes or all the time, how is the church in the United States in decline? What a great platform for the church to step up and say, you're looking for community, you're looking for a place to belong, you're looking to be loved, we have a home for you. The reason is because we've wandered off course. We may be on the right road, but we're going in the wrong direction. Instead of living out the customs and the behaviors of the kingdom of God, we just decided to copy and mimic the ways of the world. And people walk through our doors and they walk in and they're looking for something and they go, yeah, it's not what we're looking for. But Jesus said, like, if we get this thing right, it will change the world. Jesus shows up and he's talking about this brand new kingdom that he came to establish. And people were confused because the assumption was that the Messiah was going to come and form this uh, like physical kingdom. He was going to reestablish Israel as this powerhouse. And Jesus shows up and he's not concerned about that stuff at all. And instead, he, he talks about this kingdom that you can't see. It's a kingdom of heaven that's come to earth. And, and the people who participate in it live different and act different. And that becomes the measurement of their lives. In fact, in Mark 1, Jesus shows up right at the beginning of his ministry. And that's all he's talking about is his kingdom. So says, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. It's here. So repent and believe the good news. Jesus said, it's time. I've came to establish a brand new kingdom, and people who participate in it will live and look and act and believe differently. And he said, man, this is good news. This is going to change the world. The very next verse, this is what happens. Jesus says, as he walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus says this, come and follow me. And I'm going to send you to go out and fish for people. Jesus said, I'm launching this brand new movement, this brand new kingdom. And it all centers around people. We need people to participate. And this is the launch of the church. Jesus said, this is what my kingdom is about. It's always about forming and creating community. So how is it possible that the American church is struggling so much. We're watching more churches close than start. Most churches, more than 75% of churches have either plateaued or declined. When we live during a time when people are in desperate need for community, and that's what Jesus came to form. And the conclusion has to be, because we got off course, instead of being a place that's known for love and acceptance and grace, we've we adopted the customs, the behaviors of this world, and we've isolated and left people out and judged and pointed fingers. And because of it, people want no part of it. But Jesus said, like, if you will get this thing right, like, if you can figure this out, this is how the world is going to know the love and goodness of God. In fact, Jesus says it this way in John chapter 13. He said, a, a new command I give you, brand new command, love one another. This is the command. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone, the world, our community will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus said, really simple command, and and he, he echoes this a few times. One command I give you, love one another. This is the kingdom of God. And what Jesus says, if we get this thing right, Everyone will know, but if we don't, the world will not see the love and goodness of God when we choose to love people the way Christ has loved us. So I think Jesus had to keep this simple because he understood that the way this message was going to move was going to be through word of mouth, through action, through deed, through serving people around them. When Jesus says this, this is Decades before the majority of the New Testament letters have even been written. 
way before most of them would even begin to be circulated and passed around so other people could read them. We're still centuries away from people taking these letters and binding them together and calling them the New Testament. We're still 1,500 years away from the invention of the printing press. The majority of Christianity, most people have not had access to Scripture. And so Jesus said, let's keep this thing really simple. This is the kingdom of God. Love people. Just create communities, love people, and the world will see how great I am. And man, we mess this up, and it's so simple. A lot of scholars believe that the rest of the New Testament, all the letters of the New Testament, are simply answering this question, what does it mean to love? Like, what does love require of me in marriage, as a parent, as a friend, in conflict, in the world around me? They're just answering this question, what does love look like? And if you take that lens and read through the New Testament, you'll see so much of the New Testament is just saying, come on, love people around you, because if we figure this out, the world will see the love and the goodness of God. Now, this phrase, one another, is in the New Testament more than 100 times. And there are all these commands of things we're called to do to one another, how we're supposed to express the love that God has shown to us. And today, uh, I don't have time, obviously, to go through um, all 100 of the one another commands. Instead, here's what I'm gonna do. I, I, I put them all in, in three different categories, three different, or four different themes, excuse me. And, and I think if we look through them, we'll see that, that all the one others could almost all of them can fit under one of these four themes. And here's the first one, just simply love. 16 times in the New Testament, it says this, love one another. Now, in in the Greek, there's four different words that the New Testament would use for love. One has to do with how we love our family. One is is a romantic love. One is a love of friendship. And then there's the way that God loves us, agape love, a love with no strings attached, a love that pursues after, a love that's quick to forgive, a love that believes the best in people, a love that assumes that their intentions were right, even when they were, were wrong. And when we're called to love one another, it's that love, agape one another. This is the call of followers of Christ. This is what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, is that we're called to love people, to agape them, to love them in a way that we believe the best. And in a world that's so quick and bent towards outrage, and canceling people, and labeling people, and avoiding people that we disagree with. This is how the church stands out, is by agape love, by pursuing after people, by believing in people when no one else believes in them. And I don't know about you, but I need that type of love in my life all the time. Because even when I don't mean to, at my best, I still hurt people, and I wound people. Just this week, I was reminded of just a failure in my life. Several months ago, I went up to someone in our church who I love, and I said, hey, I, need, I want you to do this for me. Would you please do this in a few months? You would be great at this. And they said, yeah, it'd be great. I'd be honored to. And then I completely forgot about it. a few months later. I was like, oh, I need to find somebody to do that. And so I asked someone else, and they agreed to do it. And then I got an email from the first person that said, hey, when do you want to start talking about that? And I realized, oh, my gosh. I've promised this to two different people. And immediately I was embarrassed and I didn't know what to do. And so I just had to say, hey, you're going to have to forgive me. I can't believe I did this. And and I'm sure this hurts. But I just completely forgot that I had asked you to do this. And somebody has already committed and they've made plans. I'm really sorry about that. And their response to me was, don't worry about it. Of course I forgive you. We're friends. You're my pastor. I was fully anticipating, I can't believe you did this. I can't trust you. I don't know what this means about our friendship. Instead, they extended grace to me that I did not deserve. And what Jesus says is like, if the world is going to see the love and the goodness of God, we have to be known as people who love. And my guess is people that are not in our building today, if you ask them about the church, they don't go, man, that's a loving group of people. They just love everybody, don't they? That's not what they think about us. They think that we're arrogant and prideful and political and have a desire to be right and judgmental. And that's not the way of God. That is not the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, if you'll get this one thing right, 
if you'll learn to really love one another, then the world will see the love and the goodness of the Father. Here's the second theme that we see as of all the one another's. It's this desire for unity. And there's all these commands, these one another's, of ways that we can promote unity. Here's a few of the phrases we see in Scripture. Accept one another. I don't see anywhere in Scripture that says fix one another. Just the posture of the church is we accept and love one another. We're quick to forgive. A part of being a follower of Christ, the movement of Christianity is built around this idea that we extend radical forgiveness to people around us. We bear with one another. Some people are unbearable, but because we're followers of Jesus, we bear with them. Be patient with one another. You know, sometimes we forget how long it took us to get where we are, and then we expect people to be where we are overnight, and the posture of a follower of Christ is just to be patient. And they consider others better than ourselves. See, there's this theme all throughout the New Testament that part of being a follower of Christ is we, we fight for unity in a world that's becoming more and more fractured and more and more divided. The posture of the church is we fight for unity. Just last night, Brittany and I were spending time with a friend of ours, and we were just talking about the last several years, the last political season we went through, covid and we were just grieving the fact there were so many people in our lives who got overly political and divisive, people who love Jesus, people who are friends of ours, and it just caused so much division and families aren't speaking to each other. And we're just talking about how painful that season was for us as, as friends and family members and as a pastor. And the friend we were spending time with said, it's not going to get better, is it? I was like, it's probably not. It's just the way of the world. But that's not going to be who we are at Grace Christian. We are going to fight for unity. This upcoming political season, we are not going to participate in Facebook arguments and trying to win. Instead, we are going to aim for unity. We're not going to divide and put labels on people and avoid people because primarily we are not Republicans or Democrats. We are followers of Christ. We are a part of a different kingdom that fights for unity. It's who God's called us to be. And when we get serious about loving our neighbors and caring more about them than winning an argument, that's when our influence starts growing and people get to see the love and the goodness of God. You know, I'll tell you this, I am, I am proud of the shift our church has been making towards be, being more diverse. About five or six years ago, I just got tired of of the way my life was. I mean, everybody around me was just pasty white, every single person. And I just was tired of it. I just, I desire perspective. I love being around people who are different than me and have a different upbringing, come from a different social class than me. And honestly, when I look at Scripture, Revelation 7, 9, describing what heaven looks like, it's full of every tribe, tongue, and nation. There's something in my heart that says, I just long to be a part of a community that doesn't look like me, but it looks more like heaven. And we got a long way to go. But man, I'm proud of the, the shift and the changes our church is making. Just, just this week, I became aware of that. You know, for years on, on Mondays, I would sit in a room with a group of old white guys, and we would work on the sermon every week together. And I looked around the room this week, and I'm like, man, we got people that are young, and people are old, like Frank Mink. I mean, a few times we had to shake him, make sure he was still alive, and he was still there with us. And we had men and women in the room, and people of different races. And I'm like, man, how much better is the church well, there's people from different perspectives and, and different backgrounds. And, and this Easter, I saw a friend of mine at church for the very first time, and we were talking, and he said, man, I love the diversity here. And I'm like, well, we got a long way to go, but we're getting closer. And there's something about the heart of God that says, we're just going to fight for unity. We want to be around people who are like us and people who are different than us because it's reflective of who God is. I'll tell you one of the unique things about our church is, is even on our staff, we all have different theological backgrounds. We have people on our staff who grew up in Pentecostal backgrounds and Baptist backgrounds. We have some former heathens. We have some still current heathens that we're still working on. All of it is on our staff. And I love that we fight for unity. It's just not stuff that we divide over. 
Even just in the last few months, we were talking with a, a family that was newer to the church. They had questions about theology and what we believed, and, and some of it centered around some end time stuff, and, and, and this lady had really specific views, and she kind of went through what she believed, and it's got to be like this. And see, when you read this, this has to happen, and she got done and looked at me, and I said, okay, sounds great. She's like, but what do you think? And I was like, I'm really convinced after you said that. That sounds great. I was, I was actually raised like that. That's kind of what I grew up believing, and I know Dan uh, believes something different, but it's not something we're going to divide over. And she's like, what do you mean? How do you all work together? And I'm like, I don't know. We just don't talk about that stuff. We just, we're united around the idea that we want people to know Jesus. And we're not looking for reasons to divide. I mean, as a church, as followers of Christ, we have to fight for unity. Because we live in a world that is caught up in outrage and anger and fighting and dividing and winning. That is not the way of Jesus. We are looking for reasons to unite because primarily we are followers of Jesus and we belong to a different kingdom and it should be reflected in the way that we act and interact and go through conflict and all those things together because we belong to something different than the ways and the patterns of this world. Here's the next theme that we see in Scripture and all the one another's. It centers around this idea of, of serving and humility. That just one of the ways that we express love to people around us and the world around us is by taking the posture of a servant and being humble. These are some of the phrases that we see. We care for one another. We serve one another. We honor others above ourselves. We don't think of ourselves so highly, but we actually look at other people and we want to honor them before we honor ourselves. We look to the interests of others before we look to the interest of ourself. This is the way of the kingdom of God. And all throughout the New Testament, there's all these commands, one another, that center around this idea of serve one another, care for one another, honor one another. And I know when we start talking about taking next steps and getting involved in community and, and serving, I mean, the application of this is, okay, be in community, serve people. Like, get involved in a serving team here. Go down to the Amen House. Get involved with Transform Scott County. Join a small group. We start all of our excuses, and they often sound something like this. Well, I don't know if I have time. I'm really busy. This just isn't a good season for me. I don't know. I don't like putting myself out there. I kind of like being behind the scenes. I don't like talking to people. I get nervous when I'm around other people. I think what Jesus would say is, yeah, but it's not about you. All those excuses begin with, but I don't want to. I don't like to. I don't have time. That's not the way of the kingdom of God. It's not just about you. We belong to each other. And when you exclude yourself and you make excuses, the body of Christ suffers. And the world doesn't see the goodness of God. Part of the posture of a follower of Jesus is, it's not about me. And I'm going to do things that make me feel uncomfortable and things that stretch me because obedience is always challenging. But when we obey, God meets us in those moments and God uses common everyday people like me and you to do something incredible for him. And so one of the themes of the, of the, the one another's of scriptures is, it's not about you. Serve, care for other people. And the last one centers around this idea of encouragement. That one of the ways that we serve and create community is with the words that we have. Hebrews, it says, let's stir up one another towards love and good deeds. And this, this word is actually like irritate, push, challenge. Part of our responsibility as a follower of Christ is in community. When we have close proximity and friendship, sometimes we say the things that need to be said and we go, hey, let me challenge you with this a little bit. We pray for one another. It's one of the ways that we encourage one another. We speak the truth in love to one another. We comfort one another. One of the greatest things that we could do is when we have friends who are hurting and going through challenges and difficulty is to use our words to encourage them and keep them moving forward. And lastly, we just simply encourage. This is a responsibility of a follower of Jesus that our words have power. See, there's something about sitting across the table from someone and speaking words of life into them and reminding them the things that God created them to do. There's something about sitting in a living room when someone's going through something difficult and they don't think they're going to make it, and you look at them and you say, hey, you're going to make it, and I'm going to walk with you. There's something so powerful about that that I'm not convinced can always happen through like digital interactions with each other. 
And that's where I think as a culture, we, we may be on the right road. We're just going in the wrong direction. There's something about looking in the eyes of a friend or a family member or your child, speaking words of life and saying, hey, we're in this together. Our words have power. Ariel, I know I just scared you to death by saying your name. You weren't even looking at me. Now you got to pay attention. I want to tell you, God's up to something in your life. Here's what I, here's what I see. Um, a couple years ago, you walked in here by yourself. You were faithful and you showed up. Now look at the row around you. Constantly bringing people. Rarely do I see you coming in here without somebody else. And I want to tell you something, your mom's proud of you. Last week I was in Discover Grace and she was telling the, the group about her story. And she said, man, it's my daughter that got me back in church. And so I'll let you know I'm proud of you. Stay obedient. When God asks you to do something, just be obedient and God will meet you there. I'm proud of you. Glad you are getting married. Got one on your first mission trip. God's up to something in your life. God's going to use you all to do something great for him. You know, this, this past week, uh, my friend Julie buried her mom on, um, on Thursday. And Julie's been um, the best of friends to me. I've been here for 18 years. Julie's been here all 18 years. And you're one of the few people that stuck with me that long. And that's what you know I love you. I know your heart's heavy. God cares about you. When I walked out of that door this morning during worship and I saw your hands in the air, worshiping God in your pain, it spoke to my heart today. You got a pretty good son too. Logan, you got a tender heart towards God. I see goodness in you. I'm proud of you. I know it's a tough season for you. I want you to know as a church, man, we're, we're in this with you. You're not alone. I said this during the first service, but Jennifer, who's playing on the piano here behind me, Jennifer was in my youth group, and uh, she's doing all right. We got her a lot of counseling, and she's doing a lot better now. And, uh, you know, Jennifer and her family have uh, been really faithful and obedient to, to take in foster kids. And she told me this morning, she said, I'm the worst foster parent because I want to adopt all of them. And that's what she's doing. And I know it's painful and challenging as you're waiting for the courts to move. Uh, and these kids are already yours in your heart. Um, I just want you to know as a church, we're proud of you. There's something that reflects the heart of God. And I couldn't be more proud of you and your family and who you are. And uh, you inspire a lot of people in this church by the way you live your life. I want you to know I'm proud of you and I love you, okay? Miss Michelle Franchino over here. I want to tell you how much I appreciate how you encourage everybody around you. When, um, when my uncle passed away and I came up my office and you left me a note up there and brought a gift for our family. That means a lot to me. And I know that it's just my story, but that's, that's just who you are as a person. Churches are just better with people like Michelle Franchino. People who just love and serve. And I don't think you've ever stood on this stage to do or say anything, but you're valuable in the kingdom of God. We're better because of it. You raised a pretty good daughter too. We're proud of Jade. And uh, just glad you're here, Michelle. You know, our, our words are powerful. Something that happens when you look at somebody that you love and you care about and you speak the things you see in them and you challenge them. I think we've lost a little bit of that in our culture. And here's my, my call is like, can we get back to that? For some of us in our marriage this week, we've just gotten busy with schedules and getting our kids where they need to go that maybe it's been a while we just sat down and really looked at each other and shared how we feel about each other and spoke words of encouragement to each other. It's easy to do. Can we get back to that? Parents, don't miss moments. I don't care if your kids are adult. They're still in the home. Be your kids' biggest cheerleaders. That clock is ticking fast. My daughter last night went to prom. I'm like, what, what is going on right now? I don't want to miss a moment where I don't look at my kids and express how I feel about them. Some of us, we just, we've gotten busy. We're just kind of scratching the surface of, of real connection. We need to call up a friend and say, hey, let's go get a cup of coffee. Let's go out to lunch. Let's hang out together. 
It's honestly it's a strange time to be talking about community because we're about to get really busy, you know, during the summer and it makes it more difficult. And some small groups are taking a break, but some of you all, you need to get involved in a small group. Don't hesitate, just do that today. But some of us, we need to get involved in serving and find a community there, either here at the church or out in our community. My guess is there's a lot of us that, that land in that camp of saying, I either feel alone sometimes or always. And this is the really harsh truth. Unless you do something different, that's your reality. You just have to do something different, something that makes you uncomfortable. Quit waiting for someone else to be your friend and be a friend to somebody. Sign up for something. Get involved in a ministry. God created us to be in community. And when we're by ourselves, we're ineffective, and life is not how it's supposed to be. But there's something about a community, and that's what I desire for us. I want every one of you to feel known and seen and heard. But that requires effort on you. And we're going to do our best to try to create opportunities for people to get connected here. But you're going to have to put some work in. But it's worth it because we were created to be in community. Let's pray together. God, just as a, a friend and a pastor, as a dad, thinking about 73% of an entire generation that feels alone. God, my heart hurts because I know we were created for so much more. God, I, I pray that as a church, we would do a great job of helping people find a home and find community. God, this week as we take steps, maybe in our marriage, with our kids, with friends, God, I pray there'd be meaningful conversations where we really spend time connecting there's something very deeply spiritual and life-giving about just looking in the eyes of the people we love and communicating how we feel. God, I pray this week, as we take steps that you meet us in, that, in those moments, and God, together, I pray that a community be reformed here, that the world would see your goodness through the way that we love and live. We believe that when we love one another, the world will see that we belong to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if, if you don't mind, go ahead and grab that connection card that's right there in front of you. And for some of us, we need to take another step. And don't wait. Just do that. Maybe you need to talk with a pastor. Man, I, our whole staff, anybody would be glad to talk with you. Maybe you need to get involved in a small group. You need to learn more about serving. Maybe you need to go to Discover Grace. You can find a home church here and find a place to connect. Whatever your next step is, just do it. Do something. Take another step. And if there's something that we could do to pray for you, I'm telling you, if you'll write those prayer requests on my card this week, we're going to pray prayers of faith and we're going to believe that God's going to meet you uh, here in these moments. In just a moment, we're going to pass buckets down the roads. We're going to collect all of our, our connection cards. If you want to give today, you can give either by putting in the bucket or even in the drop box on the way out. I know that most of us, about 90% of the money that comes in now is through online reoccurring giving. And this is just me as your pastor challenging you to be a give first person. So one of the ways that we can honor God with our lives is just by going and setting aside the, the first part of our budget and give it back to God. And there's something about when we honor him that God honors us. And it's a joy to be someone who gives first. And so that's my challenge. And I know a lot of families are already doing that or restructuring their finances because they want that to be a priority. It's just me encouraging you again. Let's be a give first person and honor God in every single part of our lives. Hey, let's all go ahead and stand to our feet now. I'm going to invite our ushers to come as we sing and in our time together. Sing out as we give our praise. Our praise cause you son, praise cause you reign.